Hi, everybody. I'm Brian Dwyer, president of Robert Edward Auctions, and I'm joined today by our operations director, Matt Clark. We're going to go over some of the highlights from our incredible summer auction that just ended here the other day. $15.7 million in sales, a great result across the board with two items that exceeded the seven-figure mark. Matt, you worked very closely on this auction. Obviously, you had your hands on the Doyle card, which was lot number one, the top seller in the auction. Talk to me about your thoughts on this auction and, uh, and, and some of the highlights in your eyes. Yeah, auction in general was obviously incredible. I mean, you know, $15 million exceeded my expectations for it. Doyle in particular um, was really interested in that piece. I picked it up in Charlotte, um, you know, kind of was involved in the process throughout getting it restored, getting it graded by SGC, and obviously getting it up for auction. Was super impressed with how it performs. Couldn't have been happier about that. Um, numerous other pieces as well, obviously. Um, several standout seven-figure pieces always make the headlines. The Ruth Bat was awesome. Um, the Doyle was awesome, but not to you know overshadow some other really incredible results as well, like the Henderson rookie doing $144,000 in a PSA 10, um, the 1903 World Series ticket, and also the program, which sold for over $300,000 between the two different lots. Uh, great results. Yeah, really, you know, you just kind of summed up in, in, a, in a short little period of time there how we had great results from the start of the 1900s all the way through the 1980s and everything in between, cards, memorabilia. Let's go back to the Doyle for a second because that's such an incredible card. I mean, we've handled, we've, we've handled three different examples in the time that I've been with the company. Uh, anytime you get one, it's just incredible. And this one, like you alluded to, has a great story. I mean, been in the same family for over a hundred years. We were involved in getting it from the family, counseling them through the process. Uh, one of hundreds, if not a thousand different tobacco cards that they had. When you got that call, what went through your head and did you see it kind of playing out the way that it did where now today we're talking about a baseball card that went for $1.3 million? Yeah, so I mean, look, initially, you know, the, the last result was just over a million. So as soon as you get a call and there's a Doyle involved, the first thing that pops in your head is the potential for it to be a seven figure piece. Obviously, you know, there's always that looming thought. It's like, you know, we have to make sure the card's authentic. I mean, there's, there's only 10, 11 of them known. So that's the, you know, a lot of people think they have one. Do they actually? We very quickly were able to get pictures of it and we're super confident that it was the real deal. Um, and from that point forward, it was, you know, there's a lot of unknowns. It's in a scrapbook. We have to get it out to a restoration company. We have to have it properly um, restored. And then, you know, what does the back look like? And ultimately, I think that the, the, the grade coming out in VG plus 3.5 was the, the absolute best case scenario. I think it was the right grade. I think it was, um, I think the eye appeal, you know, was high end for the grade that it received. But um, yeah, I mean, exceeded my it exceeded my expectations in grade, performance of a lot, the whole nine yards. I think SGC did a terrific job with the restoration company, terrific job. The consigner was great to work with, the family was tremendous, and um, I mean, the, 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 the card just performed tremendously. The bidders were obviously super interested in it, a lot of competition right when it opened, throughout the three weeks that the auction was open, and then, you know, the final weekend, obviously. Yeah, so you, you mentioned a word that I just want to kind of elaborate on a little bit for anybody in the viewing audience that might not be familiar. So we talk about restoration. Uh, really what happened here was a, a conservation effort. So um, for anybody that's not aware with the story, we put this out on, on uh, some various social channels and some, some press releases, but the card did come to us in a scrapbook. And so we, with the consigner, had to figure out a way to safely remove it. And uh, you know, like you alluded to, I had to find that right partner in the restoration conservation world that could safely get the card out of the scrapbook, and not do anything to it other than remove it from the paper. And I think we all kind of held our breath for the couple months while we figured out with this conservation team what was the right way to do it, how long would it take. They tested a bunch of cards from the scrapbook. Um, but then to your point, I mean, the result was tremendous. So um, I think people would be surprised that this, this million dollar card wasn't necessarily handed to us on a platter. There was a little bit of a process involved. Definitely a bit of a process. I mean, I picked it up in, a, in an album, in a scrapbook album. You know, the numerous 
uh, non-sport tobacco cards, birds, lighthouses, etc., um, some T205s, and you know, predominantly T206s, which were um, adhered to the scrapbook in team order. So you know, Doyle in there with the the rest of the um, New York teams, and um, yeah, I mean, you know, it was uh, near the bottom of the page. It was in there with a bunch of cards. It was kind of just a needle in a haystack. It was really incredible that the the consigner was ever ever able to identify it, um, given you know, how inconspicuous it can be given the variation. Yeah, without a doubt. Switching gears entirely, another item that came to us that, again, wasn't necessarily as straightforward as people might have thought is Babe Ruth Bat. So lot number two sells for over $1.3 million, same identical amount as the Joe Doyle card. <clears throat> came to us already authenticated, but we had to go through a photo matching process, which ultimately elevated it to a very significant uh, price level that has not been achieved by many other bats and frankly has only really been touched by Babe Ruth bats. Talk to me about photo matching, what you think the impact is. I mean, we've had other photo matched items in the past, but uh, you know, you work closely with all the authentication companies. What's your take on photo matching and what's the impact that you think it had on this item? Yeah, so, I mean, initially, um, you know, in speaking to some of the bat experts prior to the photo match, you know, we had um, expectations on the bat that were anywhere north of 500,000, you know, 500, 750. Some people were talking about a little bit more than that. And, um, you know, in today's day and age with the advent of photo matching and how popular it's become among collectors, it's almost a necessity to get done on any major game used item. So, you know, you at least have to try, you have to know someone's got to go out and do the research to see if they can find a match. Um, you know, we tasked resolution photo matching with the project and um, they worked very diligently and very swiftly and were able to get us a match. It's a, it's a super interesting story. Um, Ruth was lent to the uh, New York Giants for a benefit game. Um, he hit a home run with the bat. Um, and then, you know, to uh, John Tauby from PSA's um, notes indicate that he likely used it um, for much of the 23 season as it shows heavy use. So, you know, in, it's difficult to to quantify the impact of the photo match, but I mean, I think in this case, hundreds of thousands of dollars um, in value add. Yeah, without a doubt. Some from pure price perspective, I think it elevated the piece, but also from a confidence perspective, you know, this game used material, sometimes it's hard to figure out, was this actually used? Was this used in a game? Was this just issued to the player? I think when you can put it in Ruth's hands, it's something that just takes a great piece to a, an even better level. When you look at the rest of the auction, I mean, obviously we could talk about these $2 million lots for hours, but when you look at the rest of the auction, I think I was struck by the variety of pieces in the auction that sold for five and six figures. Um, <clears throat> when I think about some of them, I think about the various rookie cards that we had. So we had Mantle's 51 Bowman, we had Jackie's 48 Leaf, we had Henderson's 80 Tops. What was your take on some of these high-level sales that we had uh, in that six-figure, high five-figure range? And rookie card collecting, I mean, that's an area that's exploded. Is it any coincidence that some of these high-ticket items were also rookie cards? Yeah, I don't think so at all. I mean, I think that for a lot of these players, we're talking about Mickey Mantle, Jackie Robinson, um, you know, rookie cards are going to be cream of the crop. I mean, everyone, they have other great cards as well, but you know, 51 Bowman Mantle and a PSA 8, um, 48 Leaf Jackie and a PSA 8, you know, these are cards that both in the in the high $300,000, you know, I mean, it's just great pieces. Um, shows a lot of confidence in the PSA brand, um, a lot of confidence behind the vintage market. Um, and yeah, great prices, um, awesome cards to have, very, very seldom see those cards in 8s. Um, I think that's the first Jackie PSA 8 that I've ever handled um, since working here. So was pretty excited about that. You don't get to see them very often. Um, you know, you see 48 Leaf Robinsons all the time, but uh, in high grade, they're just very elusive. And the same with the Mantle. So um, I was personally really impressed with the 80 Henderson. You know, that was a card that um, we had actually sold uh, a number of years ago now, but we sold that exact card to the consigner. Um, and I think he paid, you know, right around 100 for it. And, um, you know, I had concerns that it might not sell for a whole lot more than that. And it, it had a phenomenal result at 144. Was that one of the cards that, you know, we build these auctions for months and a lot of stuff comes across all of our desks. Was that one of the cards that you were most interested in following as the auction developed? Or were there other things that you kind of had your eye on where 
said, I can't, I don't know where this is going to end up, and, and I can't wait to find out. Yeah, so, I mean, that was definitely one of them. Um, the Koufax rookie, PSA 9, was another one. I mean, that was a late edition. We ended up putting it on the internet-only section of the auction. Um, super curious to see how that was going to land. Um, and, you know, again, another great result at, you know, $360,000. So. Let's go away from the, the top items that maybe everybody's attention was on or was on everybody's radar. You work closely building these auctions. You work with everybody here on the team. What's an item that really impressed you that maybe somebody else wouldn't have keyed in on? Yeah, so, you know, I was kind of looking at some results that we had yesterday. And in general, I this was a, an auction where we had a lot of uh, single sign baseballs. We had um, several consigners who had given us collections of single sign baseballs that you never really get to see, many of which I've never personally seen or handled before. Um, and they all achieved phenomenal prices. And this is memorabilia that, you know, sometimes you question how wide the market is for it because we just, you, you never see the items, you know. So, um, I mean, single sign baseballs by everyone from Chick Hafey, Rabbit Moranville, um, John Ward, John McGraw, um, Harry Heilman, all ranging from 10000 to $40,000 um, in prices realized. So that was really incredible for, for me personally to follow and then see those results. Yeah, when I was looking at some of these results, I was really happy to see them. I mean, they're, they're rare items. They're worth every penny. <clears throat> but I think in the context of REA, a lot of people think that we're strictly cards and maybe even just strictly baseball cards. It was nice to see these really big memories, mem memorabilia results so that people can say, okay, you know, they've got, they've got a deep network of buyers. They've got people for everything. Something else in the auction that I was very curious to follow and I was super impressed by when I saw it come in, um, also non-card, but card-related, 53 Tops artwork display. I had never seen anything like it. I've handled a lot of 53 artworks, never seen something presented this way, and also with this incredible story. That was another thing that you were very intimately involved with. Talk to me about that. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, right up there with the Doyle, probably one of the best stories of any of the pieces that we had in the auction was the 53 artworks. and. 53 artworks are known to be out there. We've sold a number of them in the past. Um, great pieces, highly collectible. And then, you know, the story associated with this one is tremendous. I mean, consigned by um, the grandson of one of the co-founders of Topps. Um, you know, been hanging framed uh, in, in this gentleman's possession since he was a young boy, um, you know, for 70 plus years. And um, it's been just awesome. And, you know, he called up and really had um, knew they were worth something, didn't know what, wasn't really familiar with the auction process, had seen that we had sold some in the past, and, you know, we were able to work with him, you know, pretty pretty quickly to get them in our possession, and um, they've been in that framed display, essentially, for decades, and, you know, that's how they were offered, and I, I think, again, you know, highlighted, obviously, by Yogi Berra and uh, numerous other players on there. Just one of the coolest pieces in the auction. Yeah, you had Rizzuto and Red Shane Deans and Dom DiMaggio on there, this is, to the best of my knowledge, the biggest grouping of 53 artworks since REA sold Cy Berger's collection, which I think was 12 years ago, maybe 13 years ago, and, uh, and that had dozens in them. But you, you see them generally come out in ones and twos, maybe three or four here and there. I picked up this 1903 World Series ticket and program. Uh, I remember thinking about that as, wow, can't believe these exist, can't believe these are together. What a cool item. Have no idea what it will go for. Um, ticket collecting is something that I think we've seen um, really evolve. And I guess I'd be curious to get your take. I mean, you've been at REA for several years. We've seen the market change. We've seen ups, we've seen downs. Ticket collecting, and then I would say other areas like photography and some of these other uh, non-card areas are really getting some steam behind them. Curious as to your thoughts, I mean, $270,000 for this ticket, um, pretty remarkable. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, especially considering where it was at in the final, heading into the final weekend, you know, it was at, I don't remember the exact figure, but, you know, like 20, grand. 20 or $30,000, <laughs> um, you know, and, and my expectation on the ticket initially when I saw it, again, you know, not a whole lot to base it off of, it's a, exceedingly rare, um, was probably that it was a, right around a six-figure piece, so... I was hoping for you know anything in that like ninety to one hundred and ten thousand dollar range, and obviously you know as the as the bidding kind of winded down, the the uh, attention that that ticket got was tremendous, and 
um, you know, just a few guys there just continuing to battle it out. And she really shows the desire for how, how rare those pieces are. And um, opportunity to own is is exceedingly rare. And, yeah, and guys few just... and far between. Yeah. So, you know, that was another one that I was super impressed with. Um, glad it got there. Final question for you. You talk about sitting there on the on the closing day. I mean, walk us through real quick. When you build these auctions, when you work with the team, how much stuff comes in that you've never seen before? How much stuff comes in that you have no idea what it's worth? And is it at all, um, what's the word, nerve-wracking maybe, for you to have to wait three, four, five months to see this all play out? Yeah, so I mean, listen, I, I think that you know the pieces come in and you're, you obviously get naturally very excited about them, but there's, there's such big auctions and we're running them so frequently now that you can't spend too much time you know, focused on one single piece. You get it in, you give it the work and attention that it deserves, and then you, know, you have to continue to build the auction around it. So um, during those several months where we're building the auction, I think it's kind, of, um, it's kind of nice because you can move from piece to piece and you know, you're constantly working and building, getting more material in. And then on, on, while the auction's live, you're kind of reviewing all of your work and seeing all of the bids come in on all these different pieces. And, um, and then on closing night, obviously, it's just very exciting. And um, especially in the, the final few hours where you know, the bids are coming in fast and furious and um, kind of things are getting hit from all sorts of different directions. And, you, you know, especially in extended bidding after midnight, you can't even keep up with all the bids. Yeah. It's just very fulfilling to watch uh, all the items come full circle. Yeah, I think people would be surprised that we process just as many bids in the final 24 hours as we do in the two weeks leading up to it. Um, we talk about building auctions. I mean, we're currently building uh, September, October, fall auctions. We have these monthly encores. We have the upcoming fall catalog. What are some of the items that have already come across your desk for these upcoming auctions that you're excited to have and excited to watch? Um, yeah, one of the ones that we just got in a couple days ago for our September auction is a 1915 Cracker Jack Rube Marquard in an SGC9. Um, Cracker Jacks have been on fire lately. Uh, obviously, we had some 1914s and 15s that had great results in this auction. I'm really excited to see how that card does. I um, think there's been a lot of strength behind SGC lately, um, and you know these prices have been crazy, so I, it's going to be a feature lot in September. Really excited to see what that one does. Yeah, when you talk about SGC, I mean, the two highest selling items in REA's history are in SGC holders. So you talk about confidence in the brand. Um, very exciting. Well, look, I mean, this auction was an incredible result, uh, top to bottom, a lot of variety, a lot of great prices for our consigners, a lot of happy buyers out there too. Um, appreciate you taking a couple minutes here to talk through it with me. We got auctions to build. I'll let you get back to it, but uh, hopefully we get some stuff coming in so that when we do this again after the next auction, uh, we have more great stories to tell. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. It was fun. Yeah.